The dangers of sugar consumption, how to sugar proof your kid's diet. We all know that excessive sugar intake can cause harm to our body, but are you aware of the dangers of sugar consumption on our growing brains, brains and bodies, especially in children? The damage can begin early in life, resulting in fatty liver disease, prediabetes, obesity, and elevated risk for eventual heart diseases, not to mention behavioral, emotional, and learning problems. Would you like to learn some practical solutions to reduce sugar consumption to a healthy level? Especially raise informed and empowered kids who can set their own healthy limits without feeling restricted. Then this is the program for you. Give us some thumbs up if you think this topic is important for you. Thank you, friends, for joining today. I'm sure you're going to learn a lot. Today, we have two wonderful guests, <laughs> Dr. Michael Goran and Dr. Emily Ventura. They are re researchers and authors of Sugar Proof. They will be discussing the effect of sugar on our kids' bodies and minds. They will share the strategies to successfully reduce your kids' sugar consumption to a healthy level and some tips for creating tasty yet sugar-proof recipes. So, Dr. Michael, can you tell us a little bit about you? Hi, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Michael Gorin. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and the University of Southern California. I also direct the program of research in diabetes and obesity at the Children's Hospital and the University of Southern California. I'm the co-director of the Diabetes and Obesity Research Institute. Wonderful. Thank you for joining us today. And Dr. Emily Ventura, can you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm a public health nutritionist, and I also have my PhD in health behavior research. And I've taught families in a number of different settings, including within the research setting in Dr. Michael's lab and also at UCLA and in Italy as well, where I worked as a Fulbright scholar. And I've also worked in the community in a number of settings um, with families and children. Well, thank you for joining. And if this is the first time you're joining, my name is Dr. Rosina, and I've been helping you guys with stress, anxiety, and depression on this platform. Over the last 20 years, I have been serving as a medical, direct, a medical doctor specializing in psychiatry, a best-selling author, and a transformative speaker. I started this program, Happy and Healthy Mind, with Dr. Rosina, because... I truly believe that there's a lot of suffering that could be prevented with the mind training. So over here, we share practical tips for your mental fitness so you don't have to suffer unnecessarily. These interviews are broadcasted live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And if you're joining us during the live program, you can ask questions by putting them in the comment section. And please note that all we talk about here is for your education and empowerment, and it's not designed for treatment. So I encourage you to talk to your healthcare professional for specific advice. And although we cannot give you treatment advice here, what we can do is send you the resources and reminders so you could ask the questions during the live broadcast if you text the word joyful to the number 38470. And if you are joining us from outside US, you can also join our Facebook group, Happy and Healthy Mind with Dr. Rosina by clicking the link in the description and you'll get access to all the resources. So purpose of this program is to bring health and happiness to a million people. So if you find any value in these programs, like, subscribe and share so more people can be helped to live happier and healthier life. So today our topic is the dangers of sugar consumption, how to sugar proof your kid's diet. And like I say, how to sugar proof your kitchen, so your diet too. So Dr. Emily, uh, let me ask you first, before we share how you got interested in this topic, can you share an example of someone you have helped, what kind of problems they were facing before they applied the techniques or tools that you're going to share in this program? Sure. One of the families that we worked with that we also talk about in the book had a 14 year old daughter who was falling asleep every morning in second period class at 9 a.m. And her name's Grace and she's a straight A student, so smart, completely capable of handling the material, but just couldn't stay awake. 
And it got to the point where her parents got an email from the science teacher saying, I can't figure out why Grace is so sleepy. You know, she's going to bed on time. What's going on? And they really couldn't figure it out until they ended up doing our seven day sugar challenge, no added sugar challenge. Wonderful. And what kind of differences did they see in her life? Well, one thing that Grace changed during the seven day challenge was her breakfast. And that ended up being really the culprit that was causing her drowsiness in school. So she was having Honey Nut Cheerios with milk and also a glass of peach, orange, mango juice. And then she was having two different types of vitamins. One was a calcium chew and another was a gummy vitamin. And that breakfast was 40 grams of sugar, which is 10 teaspoons or roughly the same amount in a can of Coke. And it's nearly twice what we would recommend for a child of her age. And so she was experiencing a huge spike in her blood sugar and then crashing by second period and couldn't stay awake. So when she changed her breakfast, how did the uh, life change? Well, she made just a simple change to her breakfast. One of her favorite new breakfasts was oatmeal with pecans and raspberries and she skipped the juice and started to drink water and suddenly she had more steady energy thanks to that lower sugar breakfast with higher fiber that gave her more stable blood sugar level and didn't cause drowsiness at school that's wonderful wonderful so dr garan how did you get interested in this subject really this has been the topic of my research for over 30 years so this is what I've been doing. And I think it got to the point where we realized that sugar is really such a big problem for children today. Sur kids are surrounded by sugar, 70% of processed foods, 80% of foods targeted towards kids have some type of added sugar. And from our research, we learned that sugar was the number one dietary issue that kids are faced with that's causing short-term and long-term problems to their health. And so I wanted to get this information out to the public to make people more aware of this problem and to help them overcome this problem. So half of the book is all about solutions to help families uh, resolve this problem. So it's really a culmination of the research and urgent public health mes message that's in here to get families everywhere to right-size sugar for their family. Not necessarily to eliminate it, but to identify the hidden sources and reduce it to a healthy level. And Emily, how did you get interested? What really got me interested was an internship that I did way back as an undergraduate student at the Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley, which is a garden project where kids learn to grow their own food and harvest it and bring it into the kitchen classroom and prepare what they've grown. And that's how I saw how hands-on nutrition education really makes a huge difference in getting kids excited about trying new fruits and vegetables and trying new foods. And also made me just realize what an important life skill is, learning how to cook, and how once you know how to make some basic things, really you're able to take care of your own health and, and also to enjoy the process, which I think is so important, just that enjoyment of good food. Wonderful. And then, yeah, and then I went on to, you know, do my graduate work and study and work with Michael and work in the community. Wonderful. So oh, tell us some the most interesting finding that you found in your research. Yeah, I might have to talk about a few of them because it was an interesting story. So, I mean, one major breakthrough was just figuring out what is in popular beverages and foods. And so one simple study we did wasn't even really involving people. It was just analyzing what's in popular foods and beverages. And this was part of Emily's graduate work as well, actually. So um, we basically purchased several, quite a lot of samples of different types of beverages, and we sent them off to laboratories to have them analyzed. We knew that they were high in sugar, but we wanted to know more about the types of sugar. And... One of the things we found out was that popular beverages and foods had more of a sugar called fructose. And at the same time, we were realizing that fructose in particular was causing problems for childhood development. So we realized that there's kind of been a shift. We know kids are consuming more sugar than ever, and that's a problem, but also different types of sugar. 
And it's those different types of sugar that tend to cause problems with childhood development. So you were going to show us a little demonstration. I think that'd be great for people to realize. So can you show us how much sugar is present in a glass of apple juice? Yeah, and somebody's actually just asking this question, recommendations for fruit and fruit juice intake. So I do want to make the do want to make the important differentiation because the sugar in fruit is is not problematic. It's it's in smaller amounts and it's slowly absorbed. But in fruit juice, even if it's 100% natural, fresh squeezed apple juice, orange juice, the sugars get liberated. And it's this liberation of sugars that concentrates them in high amounts that causes problems. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to flip my camera a little bit to this cup of tea that I've made here. It's a cup of tea. Maybe you add it one spoon of sugar, right? But what if you added two, oh my God, three, that would be too sweet. Four. Oh, oh, no, 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 stop. Five. Oh my God. Six. Okay, there's six teaspoons of sugar. That's about how much sugar you're going to get in a glass of apple juice or orange juice. Oh my God. If you wanted to then take a can of soda, you'd go to seven. Oh my God. Eight, nine, Oh my God. 10. Okay. Now, would you imagine drinking that? Oh my God. No, nobody's going to drink tea like that. And you are drinking. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) That is going to wrap me up all day. But, you know, there you have the graphic in front of you. So even though you might think the sugars in natural apple juice are healthy, And it's perfectly healthy to eat an apple because you're not going to get as much sugar and it's going to be slowly released and it's going to come along with all the fiber and all the nutrients in the fruit. But when you squeeze it out of the apples or the oranges and put it into a box, you become very concentrated. And it's that high concentration of rapid fire sugar that causes a lot of problems. That's that is eye opener. (laughs) Thank you for sharing this. (laughs) Sure. All right. And so, you know, what kind of problems physically and mentally people could have if they end up like, it seems like a lot of kids actually drink uh, juice of apple every day. Even the little kids, sometimes Mm -hmm. we Mm -hmm. are feeding or giving them apple juice or other juice boxes. So each day, every day, they are getting this much of sugar. How does it Mm -hmm. affect their brain and their body? Well, over, over time too much sugar, including sugars, even from healthy looking sounding apple juice is going to cause a lot of problems, literally from head to toe. And what we've found in our research and write about is that those sugars are more harmful to children because children's bodies are growing, their organs are developing, and they're not fully equipped yet to handle all that sugar. So this could range from effects on memory and concentration, just like Emily talked about with um, Grace, that student who was falling asleep, or it could be long-term effects. Actually, long-term studies show that people who habitually consume sodas have a smaller brain, and other studies show it can lead to brain inflammation, impairments of memory, worse performance on academic test scores. And then through the body, we're talking about digestive issues, effects on gut microbiome, classic sore tummy situation in children could just be due to too much sugar, diabetes risk, longer term risk for heart disease, and now a new disease, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Wasn't even a disease 10 years ago. Most liver disease was due to too much alcohol. Now almost all liver disease is due to too much sugar. Hmm. So this is kind of a little confusing. How does sugar lead to fatty liver? What's the relationship between fatty liver and sugar? What happens is that the liver converts sugar into fat. And it does that more so when sugar comes into the body in high concentrated amounts. Not from the apple that you're going to eat this afternoon, but from the 
sugars in juices and sodas like we just talked about when it's coming in in high concentration that's when the liver which is supposed to clear everything bad out of the blood like toxins and alcohol and drugs it treats fructose in the same way the fructose is the natural sugar from apple but we weren't designed or built to be consuming large amounts of this in free form so the liver actually takes it out of the circulation immediately and you know what it does with that fructose is it converts it into fat. And that fat either gets stuck in the liver and causes buildup of fat inside the liver, which eventually destroys the ability of the liver to function, or it gets released back into the circulation as lipids, cholesterol, and that's where you get high cholesterol, high lipids in the blood, the classic preclinical sign of cardiovascular disease. So long-term studies in adults show that it's high amounts of sugar over time that lead to risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. Wonderful. And you know, when it comes to mental health, we see that kids who consume a lot more sugar, they are much more hyper and ADHD gets much worse. A lot of kids look like ADHD even if they don't have ADHD because of the sugar intake. A lot of times sugar leads to inflammation, like you said, and so that inflammation is related to a lot of mental health conditions, especially depression. So people can actually become more depressed when they consume inflammatory diet. And so controlling the sugar can also improve their emotional health in addition to the focus and concentration and physical health. So that is very enlightening. So thank you for sharing that, that information. So let's kind of jump to some practical advice of what we can do, like Kerry was asking. But before we do that, let me ask the audience, can you guess how much sugar is present in a blueberry muffin from Starbucks? All right. So you can put in the comment section, is it one teaspoon, five teaspoons, or... 10 teaspoons. Let's see what your guess is. And while people are answering that question, can you share some of the tools that people can apply in their life right away? Who wants to share first? You want to go first, Emily? Sure. So shockingly, 70% of all processed food and 80% of snacks marketed to children have some form of added sugar in them. So one of the easiest ways to reduce your sugar consumption is to you know, lower the amount of processed foods that you're having in your diet. And sadly, a lot of the foods that are specifically marketed toward children are full of sugar because sugar sells. So kids are have a more um, inherent preference for sweets and they get easily hooked on these products. So taking a look and, you know, just seeing, are you buying commercially made granola bars or yogurts or crackers even can be full of sugar. And we have a lot of good tips in our book for easy swaps that you can make, either other things that you can buy or things that you can make at home to skip those added sugars and um, come up with some alternative snack ideas. We put a large emphasis on breakfast because we um, give you suggestions for how to avoid getting your kids on what we call the sugar roller coaster, which is having a sweet breakfast and then having that rise in blood sugar like Grace was having every morning and then the subsequent crash. Because what happens is when you crash, you instinctively crave more sugar to restore your blood sugar levels to a higher like you, steady you level. Them. Right. Yeah. And that, that roller coaster can be really hard to get off of once you get on it first thing in the morning. And it can lead to also a cycle of irritability and moodiness that a lot of parents experience with their children throughout the day. So we give so many different tips for how to, how to skip that roller coaster, how to have a sugar-proof breakfast, how to make some easy swaps on snacks, and then also pantry staples that families might be buying. So can you share some of the things over here so that people can apply? And like, you know, one thing that we were talking the other day, you were talking about liquid sugar. So what's yes. the difference between liquid sugar and solid sugar or sugar that is naturally present in fruits? 
Well, as, as Michael mentioned, you know, any sugar in the liquid form, whether it be an energy drink or sports drink or juice or soda, um, a co sweetened coffee drink, all those things provide a really concentrated dose of sugar that the body has a hard time processing. And especially if those are sugars that are high in fructose, like you'd find in a fruit juice or a commercially made smoothie, um, those are particularly hard you know, on the liver and can lead to long-term damage that goes unnoticed and families don't realize what's happening. So um, we make a lot of suggestions for how to get your kids more excited about drinking water or things like herbal tea. Um, and we give two different options, suggestions for how to go about that. One is a seven day challenge where you can kind of just go cold turkey, take it all out and come up, you know, come up with some new ideas for your family to Im implement immediately. And, or a 28 day approach where you just gradually reduce and start watering down some of those sweet drinks and slowly coming up with new alternatives. And both of those approaches can be really effective and some families find one more useful than the other. Wonderful. And I know you guys are running that seven day challenge right now. When, yes. is, it when is it ending? I thought Tomorrow. I started, right? Yes. So this okay. is something you can do anytime. It's all the details, the basic details are in the book, but we've been doing a community wide challenge where um, my family, my two boys and I and Michael's family and a lot of other of our followers have joined us. And we've been doing this. Um, we're on day six of seven now. It's been all great. Right. I just broke my challenge with that sip of tea. <laughs> <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. Well, like, you know, I, I just wanted to let the audience know that if they want to join, they can still join. And like you said, it can, right. they can do it at any time and they yes. can go yeah. to Instagram no for uh, what is the tag that they can do? Sugarproof? At Sugarproof Kids. And we're probably oh. going to be doing it again. We've had such a great response to this first one. Mm -hmm. and it's probably really better to join when we start a new one. But if you e also email us, we can put you on the list or the next time we do it and just email us to hello at sugarproofkids.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And we have a lot of comments coming, so I want to acknowledge that. So thank you everybody who answered the questions and Andrea and Nikix and Asif and Jamil. You guys are right. Yes, there are 10 teaspoons of sugar in, in a blueberry muffin. So a couple of people said, somebody said 40 grams and somebody said 56 grams. So can you guys clarify how much is that equivalent to? 40 grams? It's uh, four grams per teaspoon, yeah. So, and it may vary, you know, you're going to see different products in different scenarios. And obviously it depends on the size as well, obviously. Yeah. And in this particular case, the 40 grams will include the natural sugars in the blueberries, but the vast majority typically in a commercial blueberry muffin will be sugar added uh, in the form of some type of sweetener, sugar itself or syrup or whatever. Hmm. That kind of gives a relevant question because of course there is grains in, in a muffin. So the question is, are whole grains okay, or do you suggest a low carb diet for kids? Carrie's yeah, that's asking. a great question. Yeah, that's a great question, Carrie. I mean, I think the right type of whole grains are probably okay. And in sugar proof, we use a variety of, of different grains like uh, almond flour, coconut flour, oat flour. Look at it though, because surprisingly, things like commercial products made with whole grains, like multi-grain Cheerios, uh, they often have more added sugar. So look out for that. So even though you're choosing multi-grain varieties, make sure they don't have more added sugar. And I, clearly the quality of carbohydrate counts on what you're eating with it. So this week during the seven day challenge, for example, I've been wearing a continuous glucose monitor and I've noticed that my blood glucose can stay relatively stable even if I'm eating carbs, uh, as long as I'm eating high, good quality carbs with protein and fiber. So make sure that you're also including sources of protein and fiber because those will offset the, uh, the simple carbs, which eventually very quickly breaks down into glucose. Yeah, so like fiber decreases the absorption or the slows down the absorption. So it uh, prevents Correct. that 
spike in the sugar. Exactly, okay. exactly. Thank you. There's another question coming in. I think this is relevant to a lot of people. So thank you, Nasser, for asking this question. He said that I love to drink sweet tea. So what's the substitute? Well, I think one of the things is just possibly very gradually reducing the amount of sugar that you're putting in it. So, you know, if you're used to putting in three teaspoons, take it down to two and a half for a week and then down to two and just, you know, kind of re calibrate your taste buds for the tea. And then you can also be trying different types of teas, perhaps. I'm not sure if you want to let us know what type of tea is your favorite. Definitely not this one. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, are you drinking, is it black tea or green tea that you're sweetening? Or, you know, if if you do like herbal teas, there are a number of teas that are naturally, you know, they're fruit teas that are not sweetened. They just sort of have the flavor that tastes slightly sweet. Some of the ones like the hibiscus type teas or, you know, ones that have some rose hips or licorice root, those can taste quite sweet, even though they actually don't have any sugar in them. So you could kind of rotate different, different types of tea in. So let me kind of clarify the question further, because the culture that I come from, there's this tradition of drinking black tea with milk and sugar and it's kind of really cooked and so a lot of people have habit of drinking the tea in the morning and in the evening so like you know two cups of tea is a common practice that's how i saw everybody uh, drinking growing up Mm -hmm. and so i think replacing that tea with any other type of tea is very difficult for a lot of people even like (laughs) going to no sugar or no milk is very hard Mm-hmm. So do you have any suggestions for that, for the black tea? Well, the milk is okay. I mean, milk does have naturally occurring sugar in the form of lactose. And so that does kind of help sweeten the tea some. So that might, you know, if you're you know, still having some milk in it, you might be able to start enjoying it, just having it with the milk and without the sugar. Um, but, you know, another thing to think about really is, over the whole course of the day, how much sugar you're having. So if you're really not having other sweets in your diet and your one pleasure that you want to use sort of your quote unquote sugar budget for is having a spoon of sugar in your tea, then, you know, and that isn't setting off your blood sugar, then that's probably okay. But, you know, if you're having a sweetened tea, but you're also having that blueberry muffin with it, then you really might want to start thinking about how much sugar is in that particular episode of, you know, that meal or across the whole day where are the other sources of sugar in your diet and, and sugar yeah. sugar substitutes are not a great right. alternative in this situation either so, so try not to fall into that trap of using stevia or monk fruit or other um, low calorie sweeteners which are high intensity sweeteners you know, broadly available in the market those can have their own problems over time i'd much rather you just try to cut down from two teaspoons to one teaspoon of sugar, um, then replace that with a high intensity sweetener because those are going to introduce a whole set of different problems. So much better to enjoy the naturalness of sugar or a dab of honey or syrup in, in, in your tea than to replace it with some synthetic high intensity sweetener. So, so honey is better than the plain sugar? Well, in a sense, yes. I mean, if I had to put them on some type of hierarchy, I mean, it's it's naturally produced, it's less refined, it does have some other um, nutrients in there, and you can control how much you're adding by dropping uh, into, let's say, tea or coffee. So it is slightly better, it's less refined, but it, it still is added sugar, so you still have to watch out for how much you're adding, and if you are adding honey, you know, just Try to gradually add a little less, and because what's happening is you've amped up your sweet taste preference. So your your body, your brain is telling you it's craving that sweetness, and it's not going to be satisfied. But in the same way that you amped it up over time, you can bring it down. So you you have control over that craving, and you can gradually bring bring it down by gradually reducing sugar, or you can do the seven day challenge. And one of the main purposes of the seven day no added sugar challenge is just to give your body a break from all that sugar. And it will reset those preferences so that when you come back to normal life after that, you'll probably be fine with, with, with less sweetener in your coffee and your body will be better off for it as well. Wonderful. We, we, 
you can you can reset those those preferences wonderful thank you so much so what would happen if people don't sugar proof their kitchens and i know we have gone in the detail but can you kind of summarize what kind of issues would have would happen if people continue to eat the way they are eating right now you want to take that one emily yeah. sure well you know as, as michael mentioned there can be just a variety of short and long term effects of a higher sugar diet so you might see that your kids are more irritable more moody if they're having regular sweet snacks and juice and things like that and also if you're doing home learning right now you might notice that your kids are less able to concentrate in their learning activities their memory won't be as sharp even in the short term and then longer term you don't really it's hard to know what's happening exactly because these kind of things aren't regularly tested for so you might not know that your child's blood sugar levels are starting to become in the pre-diabetic range or that they're starting to have build up of you know fat in their liver so it's just you know it's it's a good general practice i think to try and instill some of these healthy habits and to really get them involved in and that's what makes it fun and enjoyable and we have a whole section on how to get kids involved in the kitchen um how to bring them in on the cooking on the shopping on the meal planning just to to build those life skills and to make it more of like a fun family experience yeah and so prediabetes and other chronic illnesses may come in the long run but the short run there would be higher dentist bills <laughs> because of the tooth right. ticket <laughs> right and i'm glad you mentioned that because that is another very yeah and honestly there're just so many children that are suffering from you know cavities and tooth extractions that could be prevented yeah and one of but, the but audience... that's a, that's a really good that's a really good example of why kids are more vulnerable to yeah. decay why why do kids get tooth decay more than adults it's from the sugar but it's it's because the sugar grows bacteria in the mouth those bacteria produce acid but the teeth are developing so they don't have all the enamel on them to protect them from that acid so it's a clear cut example of how developing bodies are more vulnerable to sugar and the same is true for other organs one of the audiences is sharing a very important point thank you asif for sharing that reading labels and understanding per serving concept may also help kids to uh, and adults to understand how much sugar they are consuming because he said that the other day when he was in the snack aisle he couldn't find anything less than 25 to 40 grams per serving of sugar right yeah, so I mean, that's a real that like i mentioned early on 80% of kids snacks have at some type of added sugar so that so what you're seeing is that 80% so and this infuriates us too and is one of the reasons why we want to write the book because it doesn't have to be that way and um maybe Emily can talk a little bit about some strategies that that we use and it's unfortunate that food companies aren't providing quality food so you have to take matters into your own hands sometimes which is what we yeah. talk about in sugar proof and i i think we are kind of going over the time today but there's so interesting questions and i would like to address so let me ask the audience is it okay for the audience if we go for another 10 minutes or so please write in the comment and meanwhile i'll bring this question kerry is asking how do you get our kids excited about reducing sugar when all their friends are eating whatever they like and any adverse health effects seem to be far off for them can yeah. It, I think you know partially yeah. it could depend on your child. Some kids really love being the trend setters and bringing something a little bit different to school. I have one son that likes to do that and got all of his friends excited about the chickpea snacks, crispy chickpea snacks in our book. Uh -huh. And all the moms are asking me for the recipe and so surprisingly, you know, healthy foods can go viral and become popular just as easily as less healthy foods can be. But, you know, I think it's also about not restrict not overly restricting your children, so not making them feel like they can't have, you know, the gummy bears that were passed out on occasion, but you know, also kind of giving them agency to choose and say, well, yes, you know, you just got these gummy bears, but you know, we're also going to a party where there's going to be cake. Which would you rather have or can we save one of them for another day or, you know, giving them the choice so that it's not an, a general sugar overload and they can still participate with their friends and still try the things that they want to try. And and find out what motivates them. What what motivates right. your kids may be very different from you as a parent, so 
you got to get down on their level and figure out what their internal motivations external motivations rewards aren't going to work in the long run mm -hmm. for example you don't want to pay your kids not to eat sugar because you're ending up paying them for the rest of their life so right. find out what internally motivates them that could be you know it's going to be age dependent so it could be like better looking skin or uh, doing better on football field or in class or having more energy find out what that internal motivation is and yeah, i think the more that we can help our kids realize earlier on in life that you you know you feel how you eat so you know when they do really overdo it on sugar and they complain of stomach and they're not feeling well that's an important life lesson and you know slowly as you talk with your children if they're proposing something really sweet you can say well you know how you how do you think you might feel after you have that? You know, is there a way that we can sort of modify things around so that you won't, you know, that you'll feel well? And, and there's a lot of different ways to do that. And, and that's a good life skill as well. So we've been talking about a lot of the added sugar with the juices, the snacks. What about candies? I, I, I love chocolate and I know most of the kids love chocolate and trying to control the amount, you know, once you start eating a little bit, it's very hard to control. So do you have any suggestions for me or my patients or my kid how to limit or not take the chocolate? As a mom, so my kids are five and eight, and I see a lot of parents coming to the school gates with a bag of chocolates or candies as a snack. And one thing that we talk about in the book is that those kind of foods really don't work as a snack because they actually rev up your hunger. They make you even more hungry and they're not satisfying. So the more you can do to give your kids like healthy based snacks and, you know, maybe then after they've eaten something healthy or after a, a nice meal, they can have a piece of chocolate. And that has a lot lower effect on their blood sugar than if they were to have that chocolate on an empty stomach. And they're probably less likely to overdo it in that in that case as well because they're full. So the timing of the sweets is a, is a really important thing. That's and wonderful. there's great ways to use things like uh, cocoa powder, for example. We have several recipes in the book using cocoa mm -hmm. powder blended into cakes or blended into smoothies or chocolate sesame treats. There's, there's definitely ways to uh, lighten the sugar mm -hmm. load, but still get that chocolatey treat as well. Great point. So I would love to hear some of these recipes, but you know, the, the cocoa recipe is attracting me, but I was thinking about, I'm going to ask you about the chickpea. Snack oh yeah. <laughs> that you mentioned. Favorites. Yeah. Why don't you tell us about that recipe, please? Sure. So it, as you mentioned, Dr. Rosine, it's in our book and it's also on our blog, sugarproofkids.com. And all you do, it's so affordable and easy to, you just drain two cans of chickpeas or you can, you know, cook the chickpeas yourself if you prefer. And you dry them well and you spread them out on a roasting sheet pan and you drizzle them with some oil, olive oil or coconut oil, whichever you prefer. And then add some seasonings, so some salt. And we have a version that has um, chili powder and cinnamon and cumin. That's really great. Put a little bit of chili if you like spice. Another great option that my kids like is garam masala. Or sometimes we make more of an Italian version with sage and oregano and thyme. And that one's really good too. And you can come up with your own version. But they are, they're really satisfying. They're crispy. They're a little bit salty. And just a high fiber snack that's super affordable and a great alternative to some of the more processed snack foods out there. And these are these are fun projects as well for, for kids to get involved with. They can make mm -hmm. their own options of seasoning and spices and personalize it however they want so it can be a fun project so first you boil them and then you bake them or roast them well you if you're starting with dried chickpeas then yes but otherwise you can just get two cans of chickpeas to save time and drain those well and then dry them and then roast them yeah, just what? dry them off with a kitchen towel, you know, oh. strain them and dry them off okay. so that they roast quicker. Yeah. And then put whatever seasoning you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you sprinkle them with the seasonings mm -hmm. before you put them in the oven. Wonderful. Yeah. It's simple. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's another question coming from Sunanda. Thank you for asking, Sunanda. Her question is, how much percentage of daily value of sugar should be in one serving of cereal or snack? Hmm. Yeah, for cereal, for breakfast cereal, we say to look for less than four or five grams of sugar per serving in breakfast cereal. Obviously, zero would be great, but that's not a lot 
of those options, but four or five grams or less is probably okay, as long as it also has sources of protein or fiber. And in those situations also, again, you can supplement that. So you can have kids make their own sprinkles with uh, flaxseed or chia seed or sprinkled nuts. So kids love to do that or berries. So think about that as an option too. Get a low sugar cereal, but have your kids make their own little breakfast concoction. Kids love to make their own concoction. So use that to your advantage. That's the questions keep coming and I'll take this last one. The question is, can I use Splenda instead of sugar? Yeah, I mean, Splenda falls into the category of synthetic high intensity sweetener. And we would not recommend those, certainly not for children. We don't really have enough long-term data. Uh, for children and adults, the data that we do have show that um, habitual consumption of these high intensity sweeteners leads to a greater consumption of calories and sugar during the rest of the day. So what's happening is it's tricking the body into thinking that it's consumed calories when it hasn't. And the response to that is that it seeks more calories. Uh, as well, they can affect the gut microbiome because they aren't absorbed and other metabolic problems. And in the elderly population, over time, studies show a link between long-term consumption and cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. So certainly do not recommend those in the long run. Okay. Well, these are very, very important points that you brought up. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. I would suggest everybody who would like to get the book, to get the book Sugar Proof that is available and check out the, the blogs and a lot of free information available. And Dr. Garan has also graciously shared one of the, one of the chapters from his book, Smarter Without Sugar. And so you guys can get that access by texting JOYFUL to 38470. And when you would text that, you would get a link, a link of to sign up, link to a web page, which is, which is called Happy and Healthy Mind Gifts. And what that would do is it would give you, it would give you all the gifts that we have been doing. And so there are lots of gifts now on our gift page. And so I just want to know, tell you that the way to find it is if you say the episode HHM 42 is the gift excerpt from the Sugar Proof book. So let me kind of wrap up here. And so let me ask you, do you guys have any take home message for our audience today? Well, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the great questions. Obviously, I, we can talk all day about this, so feel free to um, follow us on Instagram, drop us questions or comments through social media. I'd love to interact with you some more. And, and the message is, you know, wherever you are on your, your food journey, there's always room for reducing sugar, whether you are vegan or paleo or whatever. Just try to start reducing sugar. Try to look for those hidden sugars. Try to eliminate the liquid sugars that we talked about. There's really no room in the diet for them so that you can enjoy sweet treats. Don't forget that eating is an important part of our culture, an important part of celebration, and it's very important to leave room for that and to make take advantage of that. And you can do that by just trying to eliminate all these hidden sources of sugar in, in, in junk foods and in liquid sugar. Thank you, Dr. Michael Garan, and thank you, Dr. Emily Ventura. And let me kind of end with my usual message to you guys. Every day is a new day, a new opportunity to live happier and healthier. Try to make maybe 1% improvement. When you keep on making 1% improvement every day, your life would keep on getting better. Stay safe, healthy, and happy. Till next time, Dr. Rosina. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosina. Wonderful to chat with you.